Hello viewers and welcome to another episode of the Enoch Generation, a generation that walks with God. Well, in our last episode, we had uh, Pastor Emmanuel with us and he told us about how the Lord touched him and transformed his life and how God began using him to transform other lives as well. So today he is with us in the studio to continue his journey with Jesus. So over to you, Pastor. Nice having you with us. And, uh, Thank you. It was beautiful when you told us about, you know, mm. how God chose you. Mm. You ran away from him, yes. but he brought you back. That's right. Transformed mm. your life and mm. God began to teach you. Mm. And it's a wonderful teaching that you spoke about, you know, humbling yourself under somebody else, you know, another servant of God and willing to do even the ironing of his shirts. And, yeah. you know, because yeah. I think we need to start there. That's right. Because that's, right. that's the right place to start yeah. before we even start ministering. So how long were you under this pastor and how yeah. long did your ministry continue this way? Yeah. So I was under him for about, I think, three to four years. I okay. served with him. And um, it was really a privilege to serve him because he was such a great man of God. He, okay. You know, he teach the word. In fact, the day he had asked me to be his assistant, I couldn't believe it. Because I had come to the church, um, I joined his church just newly, maybe a month. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I'd been serving as one of the protocol officers, you know, people that helped the ushers and okay. all of that. And mm -hmm. so I had come to church that morning very early for about 6 a.m. I'd come earlier than 6 a.m. So he usually comes very early. So um, the head of the protocol had asked me to stand at the door. So I'd come to the door mm -hmm. and stood there and he had just driven up. So he'd driven up and packed and came down from the car. He didn't know me okay. because he wasn't around in the country when I'd been appointed to join the team. So he looked at me and asked me some questions and said, okay, he gave me his bag and I carried it. And I walked into the church with him in the southern. So I think two or three Sundays later, he had called me and he asked me, he said, would you like to be my assistant? And I said, oh my God, there's so many people here. You know, they've been in this church for a long time and they served him. How is he picking me to be his assistant? And that was such a supernatural moment as well for me. Um, because he was one of those ministers I'd looked up to in the city where I was in Nigeria. in Port So Harcourt. you thought your place was only at the door. Yes. So, you know, so, and that's such a testimony because I'd been faithful to come in early. And, okay. and, and, and Auntie, that's one of the things that I tell people about coming early to church, being on time in the house of God. Look, we go early for our jobs. We go early for all these things we do in the world. But when is the time for the house of God? We usually just, you know, come one hour late, 30 minutes late and all that. And, but because I'd come early that day and met him, that was where the relationship had started with my pastor. And that was where God began to really lift me up you know, in serving the Lord. And that's where he began to teach me to serve God. But as mm. you say, we take church for granted most yes. of the time because yeah. uh, there's nobody there to question you. Yeah. yeah. You go late, you miss your flight, you miss your train. <laughs> you miss half mm. the movie if you're late in the, you know, right. the theater. Mm. So you don't want to miss it all. But that's when right. it comes to church, it's like, you know, more of telling the Lord, I've come take my attendance today. And then, you know, <laughs> that's right. you, you be a cheating mm. ourselves. That's right. That's and right. just thinking that, we are cheating, mm, God cheating God in the yes. process. But mm. I know God is so faithful. He yes. watches those little things that you do for him. Yes. And yes. You know, when you really do it sincerely, he elevates you. Amen. So the very first day when you became his assistant, mm. yes. how did you actually feel? And how did the rest of them look at you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was pretty young. Okay. Um, I was much younger. than. In fact, I think I was the youngest in the team, the mm. entire team. So for me, it was a privilege, uh, you know, to carry his bags and, you know, my body will shake, I'll be shivering, you know, I'll be a little scared. I would go and ask the other team members, what do I do? How do I? Because he was a very fast paced man, you know, he would go on a very fast pace. So I would ask the team members, I would ask questions. How do I do this? How do I do that? How do I do that? In fact, Auntie, you wouldn't believe this. The pastor that, uh, the, the, the assistant I took over from had gone to London. Okay. So I, he wasn't even there for me to ask. So I would go to the other team members that were around, you know, that knew a bit of him to ask questions about, you know, how does he like his water? How do he like his style folded? How does this, how does that? So all the questions. And, and I think it's very important to ask questions in the house of God. You know, because that's the mistake a lot of people made. I mean, I didn't know these things. I just did it out of my heart, you know, because I really wanted to serve. And a lot of people, when they go to church, the house of God, they have so many questions. 
but they don't ask. You know, they don't go to the church leaders, they don't go to people to ask, oh, how about this? This thing you do, what does it mean? What is this, what is that? And that's where the enemy comes in. Mm. The enemy uh, uh, picks up the questions and begins to answer them. Oh, this thing they're doing, it's a bad thing. Mm. Oh, it means that. And then they take it and they go away. And sometimes even the devil makes them leave the church mm. where God was meant to prepare them for their destiny and train them for where he was going to take them to. So it was, it was not an easy job <laughs> being my pastor's assistant uh, with the church he was running. Uh, it was quite a good uh, ministry. They were doing very well. And just being there was a privilege to me. So because I didn't think it was my right to have been there. So um, uh, seven was quite easy for me. Because every single moment, he would ask me, go get this for me, go do this for me, go do that for me. I saw it as a privilege to have to be doing that. Because there were a lot of more, way more qualified people. <laughs> In fact, a lot of the team would say, you small boy. And they'll tell me <laughs> off. And, and he would send me to go tell them to do things. And when I get to them, I'll say, oh, pastor wants you to do this, pastor wants you to do that. They'll be like, oh, who are you small boy to tell me what to do? I was like, oh, it's not me, it's not me. It's my pastors that has asked you to do this. That's pastor's uh, demands for you. And I wouldn't become pompous because I had seen it as a privilege. Mm. It wasn't easy. Um, they did look down on me because mm. I was a lot younger than a few of them, maybe four or five years younger than most of the team members. But I saw it as a privilege to be serving. And when they would, you know, scoff at me and say, ah, oh, look at you, small boy, who, who gave you this position? Mm. You know, you just came here to this church just barely two months and, you know. But I saw, I, I didn't want to take what they were throwing at me. And I think that's very important. You know, that we do not receive projections, evil projections, mm. you know. And, and when you see yourself uh, serving God as a privilege, you wouldn't receive people's projections to you. Because most of the time, people are an offense. Yes, that's and, it. And uh, they don't mm. want to do what God wants them that's to do it. ultimately. Yeah. In fact, a lot of people will think you're not privileged enough. In fact, mm. you don't have the right to be there. Mm -hmm. They don't think you are the right person for the job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you may not have, in fact, they, they were a lot more competent than I was. But I think my pastor could see my heart, that I was just willing to serve. I, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about ministry. Mm -hmm. I, I knew a little, Pastor Felix had taught me, devotion to prayer, the word of God and all that. But the real operations of ministry, mm -hmm. I didn't really know anything. I didn't know how to be a pastor's assistant, you know. That's a very so, tricky yeah. place that you That's are it. in. Yes, yes. Because mm -hmm. one side you have the instructions from the pastor and yeah. you have the opposition from the other team. The other side as well, yes. But yes. I think that's been a perfect training ground for you. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. I was just picturing it as you were talking, mm -hmm. you know. You a little boy facing, mm -hmm. you know, the elders in the church. It's not yeah. an easy joke. Yeah. And taking, you know, all that negativity, yeah. but yet standing firm in your calling. That's right. Yeah. So I think that would have molded you to minister anywhere among anybody. Yes, yes absolutely. Because I think even when we knew you, you were still mm. a young man. Yes. And yes. ministering to oldies like us. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, yes. And taking in all that we told you. Yes. But then I think mm. that it really molded you and brought you to absolutely. You know, that absolutely. point. Yeah. Uh, so you were there for about three years, you said. No? Three, yes. Three, four three years. Four years, and then. yes. Mm. After that, where did you move on? Yeah, so uh, the Lord had opened a door for India from there. So, okay. Yes, that's when the Lord had opened India. In fact, that's such a supernatural story it itself. Uh, when God had uh, had gotten an opportunity, actually, actually, it was actually Pastor Felix's wife okay. who had brought this scholarship, you know, to say, oh, Emmanuel, there's this scholarship that is there. Would you like to apply for it, write the exam? So I, I went ahead and wrote it and I passed. And they had given us the opportunity to go to Singapore. Okay. But the Singaporean government has said uh, a lot of us were too many Nigerians. So they split us into two. Mm -hmm. And the second half that was rejected, I was part of that. Okay. And that's when India opened up okay. uh, for studies. So good that you were rejected there. We came to yes. know you. <laughs> yes. So, so the rejection was actually God's direction for me. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. mm. So you didn't feel bad about being rejected uh, from going to Singapore? I mean, I I'd felt bad, to be honest. In fact, the whole story was I'd felt really bad because we had such good things about Singapore, one of the cleanest country of the world. So I was really looking forward to going. And when this rejection had come, it was such a, uh, a letdown for me. In fact, I had become so discouraged. And when the opportunity for India had opened up, 
Then I had uh, taken the letter, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the letter of accepting, acceptance letter that I had to sign. So they say, you know, you take it away for a few days and bring it back to us. Uh, and I'd gone to Pastor Felix to show him the letter, you know. Oh, you know, look at it. I've got this offer to India. I was going to reject it. Oh, I'm not going to go to India, you know. I'm so not. you never wanted to come and know no. each one of us here? <laughs> <laughs> so because the things we had heard about India at that time, you know, uh, there was no social media and all that wasn't really there at the time. Mm -hmm. So what we heard about India was not so good, you know, about Christianity and all that. So it was not a place I was looking forward to go. But Pastor Felix had had a vision about a map and a country written India wow. for me. Okay. So I'd gone to him and he had said to me, he said, son, before I said anything to him, he says, oh, he had a vision or a dream about me and a map and a country written in India. He says, God's going to send you to India. So I looked at him with such amazement, like, what is this? <laughs> and I showed him the letter. And he says, yes, God's going to send you to India. So that's really where the journey had begun. <laughs> in fact, my parents had asked me, are you sure you want to go to India? Are you sure? Are you very sure? And I said, yes, yes, because... I knew that what God had shown my spiritual father was such a divine alignment, you know, and, and I knew that's what, what God wanted me to do. So I just, I just went along with it. Yes. Okay. Mm. So then you decided that you were coming to India. Yes. yes. So you packed your bags. Yes. And moved straight to Chennai. To Chennai, yes, the Esaram University, yes. In okay. Chennai, then how yes. did you feel about your entire transition? And when you came mm. here, yeah. How did you feel about being oh. in a different country? It was good because I, you know, I felt God had sent me. Okay. So I had this sense of purpose from when I came. Okay. So I wasn't... Uh, oh, until you were sure that God was sending yes. you here, you weren't very happy about India. Yes, yes. Mm. So when Pastor Felix had, you know, you know, supernaturally told me, because he didn't know they had given us an offer for India. Okay. He knew about the Singapore. And you he see, didn't know about India. Yes, he didn't know that they had uh, rejected uh, the Singapore offer and given us an Indian offer. Mm -hmm. So he had that vision and I was supposed to meet him and it was such a supernatural moment. So I knew God was sending me to India from that point. Mm -hmm. So I, I embraced it. So okay. I was happy that I was going to India from mm -hmm. that point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you arrived here yes. at the Asaram University, mm -hmm. how did you feel about, yeah. you know, the entire culture here and how did you adapt to this? I mean, it was very different. Um, mm. um, meeting, uh, it's like a culture shock and everything. And uh, Were you the only one who came in from Nigeria at that particular no. point? So there was a group of us, maybe okay. around 150 of us. Something All like of you dress out of Yes, yes. Yeah. So okay. ladies and guys, yes. Yeah. So a mix mm. of us, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so you did have yeah. friends out here? Yes. Yeah. So I had a few friends uh, okay. amongst the group. Uh, one of them was my uh, roommate. We okay. lived in the same room mm. as well. And it was such an amazing journey because I said, Lord, I wanted a place of prayer, a fellowship, a place to fellowship to pray you know because I'd been involved in ministry and church and so when I came over I said Lord I wanted a place for fellowship and we heard that they had a prayer place in the campus um, the, okay. the, 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 the owners of the campus had created this uh, Muslim praying place and a Christian praying place as well mm -hmm. <clears throat> so so one of those days I took a walk into the prayer hall and I, I found this group of Indians praying and, and I walked in and I sat down and, and, and they were praying in the spirit. They were wow. praying in tongues and I said, wow. Mm. So I was surprised, you know, because mm. obviously the thing, what we heard about India was the idol worship mm. and all that. And, and I knew there was church in India. I knew that. But I was very surprised mm. to see young students praying in the spirit mm. and just praying. And, and I sat there mm. and I was just enjoying myself in God's presence. And uh, I had gone to fellowship with, with one of them after I finished, the leader mm -hmm. of the fellowship. We became my best friend. Wow. Um, he's now Apostle Sam. He's in Australia. Okay. So I met him and we fellowshiped. And, and we later on started another Nigerian fellowship. You see, so when we arrived, a few uh, Nigerians had come together, were Christians. Mm -hmm. So we started a fellowship uh, a group, different from this Indian people fellowshipping. And so I had gone to the two different leaders and they said, Oh, um, I can see the fellowships are very similar, you know, full of the spirit, love the Lord. Why don't we come together? Mm. So I spoke to the two leaders and we came together. Wow. That's and that a was the thing. beginning, yes, of the revival that God did in the Sarum campus. Mm. 
Wow. Yes. Mm. So God used you mightily there to bring yes. in peace, to bring in unity. Yes. Yes. That's yes. a very great uh, thing that you have done. Amen. It was a privilege. Yes. Yes. And when you accepted Christ, yes. were you anointed with the Holy Spirit? And when did you receive the gift of tongues and things so, like that? I received the gift of tongues. I, I believe I received the Holy Spirit because yeah. I would see dreams, visions and all yeah. that. But I received the gift of tongues uh, when I was serving with my other pastor. Okay. Uh, one of the associate pastors in the church had prayed for me. And he said to me, in fact, one day he asked me, have you received all the tongues, uh, the gift of tongues? And I said, no. And he says, hey, he just held my hand. He began to pray for me. He says, right now, receive the Holy Spirit. And I go, feel the Holy Spirit. And I began to speak in tongues. Okay. So that was the moment I began to speak in okay. tongues. Yes, yes. So this was mm. something that happened to you in Nigeria itself? Yes, in Nigeria, absolutely. So when you saw the Indians speaking mm. in tongues, that was, uh, you know... Wow, that was a the wow kingdom connection. For me. Yes, yes. <laughs> that happened. Such a so, connection, yes. Mm. So from there, mm. from the campus, mm. how did you move out to minister? Mm. So from the campus, we had invited um, some churches. You know, we had okay. worked with a few churches in the city. God had given us a privilege to work with a few uh, uh, churches. Their worship team had come. We host crusades in the campus. In fact, yesterday, I just been to the campus and I shared with them the stories of the breakthroughs and the souls that got saved. In fact, one of the meetings, in fact, the brother was reminding me that it was not 5,000 students, but 8,000 students. Wow. So amazing what Jesus did that day. We had gathered outside. We had gotten this Asia Strongest Man to do some performance. He mm. saved, I don't know if you've heard of him. Yes, the I Asia have. Strongest Man, he knows the Lord. Mm -hmm. So we had invited him with some other pastors and he would break the baseball mm. bat and do a few uh, stunts and he would share Jesus. Mm. And so many people came to Christ. And from that event, God raised more people that joined our fellowship that even became the leaders of the fellowship when I left. Wow. It was such an amazing thing the Lord did. So those pastors I worked with, in fact, I would just invite them, i write them letters, say, oh, please, I'd like you to come to our campus with your worship team. Because, see, we were just a group of uh, young students, you know. In fact, the team we had, they were all 18, 19-year-olds, 21-year-olds, okay. 20-year-olds. So they were, pretty, they, were, they were quite young. So, but the Lord did such a great thing with us. And the things he did was he taught us to pray. So anti-prayer was what really helped us to make such an impact in the campus. So some of the pastors had walked it when they came in and saw the students. They were in shock. In fact, one of them asked me, says, how do you get funding for all this? The equipment and the sound and the chairs. How did you get the money? I said to him, Pastor, it's the students' contributions. The ex-students, the ones who had left, who had written them and said, hey, we're having this event. Would you love to contribute? And they will send money in. In fact, the students will go to their parents and they would ask and the parents would contribute. And that's how God provided for such a work to be done in the Hindu campus to the glory of God. Amen. So viewers, you've been listening to Pastor Emmanuel and his journey, how God mm. shifted his residence from Nigeria and brought him to India, to mm. Chennai, to the SRM campus, where he found like-minded people, his kingdom connections, and together they began to minister for the glory of God. So you see, when God brings in kingdom connections, he brings them with a purpose. And the purpose is to touch lives, to transform lives. So you and I have been invited to touch and transform lives. So when we give our life to Christ, Christ uses us to be a blessing to multitudes. So till the next episode, it's a goodbye and God bless.